Welcome to the EdTech Show. I'm Dan Spade, and today I'm showing you how to teach your students about their digital footprint and digital citizenship. Welcome to part two of my Master the Internet series based on the presentation that I use to teach my students how to be safe on the internet, about their digital footprint, and about digital citizenship. If you haven't seen part one where I show you how to teach students how to be safe on the internet, there is a link below in the description and there's one above right now. Uh, there's also a link below in the description to my Teachers Pay Teachers where you can find a copy of this presentation. So we'll start this part of the presentation off by talking about digital footprints. We'll talk about what it is and why it's important to students. So I start by explaining that a digital footprint is any information about you online. So whether it's photos, posts, articles, comments, videos, uh, whatever information about you uh, that's on the internet and searchable is your digital footprint. And depending on the age of your students, it could be fun to have them try a Google search to see if they can find any information about themselves. Uh, but it's important that they know that it's not just what they write, but that it could be pictures and videos, articles that somebody else writes, posts that they leave on websites, uh, you know, just so they get an idea of what we're talking about when we mention digital footprint. So I explained that their digital footprint is their digital legacy. And the stuff that they put online today they may think is cool or funny, but 10 years from now, they may not think that it's cool or funny. And again, depending on the age of your students, you might have some good stories about this. Uh, you know, I, I always like to tell them that, you know, my time hop reminds me of some of the things that my friends wrote um, a long time ago when, you know, they were in college or just out of college. And they're mortified to know that every year I get a reminder of what they wrote. Um, and so it's important that they try to have some foresight into, uh, you know, the future, whether it's their college or careers or whatever it is, just their personal life, that the stuff that they're doing today is not going to go away. And that's a great transition into this next slide, which essentially says anything you send to somebody or you put online can be saved or screenshotted, which means somebody can have that forever. And there's not a thing you can do to get that back. And that should be a horrifying reality for some of the students. And um, sadly, even though the students know this, they still fall into that mistake. Um, so it's really important to just try to hammer that home that forever means forever and you can't take it back. And again, with social media, they need to know that just because you're being safe doesn't necessarily mean that your friends are keeping you safe. And, um, you know, you want them to be able to have those conversations with their friends about keeping each other safe and not putting stuff out there. And um, again, just because somebody sends something to you doesn't mean they want it shared. And I know that I've talked with a lot of students and heard stories um, that this is where a lot of things go wrong, where somebody gets something and they feel that it's just theirs to share. And that's not the case. And students should just know that we should just keep reminding them that, uh, you know, they need to be respectful of each other. And I do like to talk to students about geotags. And again, teaching in a middle school, uh, the first thing students think about when I say that is snap maps. But I try to stay away from that. And I just talk about the information that is collected when you take a picture. Um, and when you email that, or you text it, or you put it in Google Drive, or uh, drop it in a Dropbox, uh, all that information actually stays with the picture. So if you send that to somebody, they have all that information, um, and that it's kind of scary. Now, again, because you're sending it, you know who it's going to, but just knowing that that information is always in that picture and whoever those people send it to, um, it stays with it. So uh, it's important that they know that. And even though a lot of social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, they strip all that stuff out of the pictures, it is important to know that sometimes students make mistakes and they're not thinking when they take the pictures and post them and give away that location information anyways whether it's street signs in the background um, you know school logos any kind of information that people can look at that picture and know instantly where that person is or where they're from um, you know it's something that students don't necessarily think about so it's good to kind of put that thought into their head and even though every single student knows this uh, it's good. I put it in the red just to really get their attention um, that never send anyone a picture you don't want the world to see, right? It's a worst case scenario. But if you use that as your baseline, uh, you won't find yourself in a situation where something's out there that you don't want to be out there. So we're going to transition a little bit. And this next section talks about website validity. 
and i don't get into it in great depth here and i do have other lessons where we talk about that uh, but i do like to do just a quick overview here and we do the five w's um, which everybody's familiar with but how we use that for websites is a little bit different than how they always learn about the who what where when why um, so i start with who very basic who's giving you the information are they qualified is it just somebody with a blog or is this a professional and so just first thing to identify is who is creating the site and then what kind of a site is it is it a news site is it a blog is it a business site can they see that this is somebody's opinion can they detect obvious bias these are the skills they need to start develop as media consumers uh, in all facets of their life but it's good to start them right now with just trying to identify what kind of a website are they looking at and an important what is what does the suffix of the url tell them um, so depending on the age of students, some might be very familiar with this. Some might have no idea that um, certain suffixes have to be confirmed, like .edu has to be education, .gov has to be government, .mil has to be military, um, but that anybody in the world can own anything .com, .org, .net, .info, .co. Uh, and again, it can be fun to go out there and try to find some sites that look really legit, that seem official um, because they have a .com or .org, but aren't really. And sometimes this isn't uh, readily known or easy for them to find, but if they can, where is this site located? And the when, the when can be a little bit difficult depending on the website or the article, uh, but it's good if the students can identify if something is at least relatively new or if it seems dated or aged. Um, if there's no date available, they should try to develop those skills so that they can determine whether or not something is recent or not. And most importantly, why? Why does this site exist? Is it to sell you something? Is it to inform you about something? Is it to persuade you to do something? Or is it to entertain you? You have to know what is the purpose of the site you're at because um, you need to be able to tell if somebody has an agenda, what are they trying to accomplish? Are they trying to get you to do something? And this is really where we need our students to be. As um, consumers of media, they need to know what are they looking at because sadly uh, there are a lot of sites out there that do have some sort of agenda and we want them to be able to tell um, that they shouldn't just be able to trust whatever they're seeing because it's on the internet even if it's from a reputable site there could still be an agenda and they need to be aware of that and the last part of my master the internet series is digital citizenship now this is a term that gets thrown around a lot so students are probably pretty well aware of what digital citizenship is but it's still really important to hammer this stuff home because the internet is such a big part of their lives that they need to know this stuff and they need to know it really well. And so some of this stuff, they might kind of roll their eyes at because they've heard it so many times, but it is really important to keep talking about it. Um, especially stuff like negativity and being attacked. It's important to let them know, stay positive, right? Don't get into the trenches. Don't start firing back because the retaliation is only gonna lead to more negativity. And that's how things start to spiral out of control. Um, and I always tell them about my son and I who have a YouTube channel. And you know, there's so much stuff. Kids are mean. People are mean. They say things that are completely inappropriate and not necessary, but you just have to ignore it. And I've got some great stories of how, you know, just trying to even like talk to people positively who are being negative, how you can really change that person's attitude towards you. Uh, and it's happened in our lives and hopefully the students can kind of get to that too. You know what? Don't start firing back, just stay positive and maybe you can even turn that around into a positive experience. But it is really important if somebody's being negative, being threatening, uh, take screenshots, save it, because you never know when you're gonna need it or need to show it to somebody. So screenshot, save everything, uh, just in case. And even though it sounds a little bit cheesy, um, they can be the difference. And I know they see cyberbullying and that kind of stuff online all the time, and most students kind of look away. And depending on the age of the student, so that's sort of understandable. They don't want to get mixed into this because they don't want to be the next one. Um, obviously, we want to encourage them to try to get into that and stop it, to stay positive um, and try to diffuse the situation. But even if they're not comfortable with that, letting them know that, you know what, if you see somebody that looks like they're having a hard time, just send them a private message, uh, send them a direct message and just let them know that, you know what, you're there for them, that, um, you know, just be positive and let them know that you care about them because that can make a huge difference in what that person's going through. Now we're gonna transition into a part of the presentation where we discuss with the students who they're actually talking to on the internet. 
And this is important because in an age where social media and having the most followers is important, sometimes students end up striking up these conversations and relationships with people um, and it's somebody completely different than who they think they're actually talking to. And a term you may or may not be familiar with is catfish. And a catfish is anybody um, online who creates a false identity. There's actually an MTV show called Catfish where they investigate all these kinds of things where somebody is talking to somebody online and something seems fishy and they're not sure if it's actually the person they think they're talking to. And what we're gonna do now is talk about some ways that students can identify when somebody's lying to them on the internet about who they actually are. Now, unfortunately, social media is a huge part of the students' lives and to them, the more followers they have, the better they are. And sadly, a lot of times they'll get um, followers that have these like professional modeling pictures and they'll send them messages and they think they're talking to these beautiful adults that are interested in them and their lives. And sadly, I have to try to explain to them that if it's a professional looking model picture, the odds are it's not that person that's talking to you. And so I try to show them there's a couple easy ways to try to see where that picture's actually originating from. And thanks to Google Images, it's pretty easy to do that. So the first thing to do when trying to do a reverse image search is you have to save the picture and then go to Google Images. And once you're at Google Images, you're gonna drag the picture into the box. And within seconds, Google is going to um, give you results of everywhere that that picture uh, appears online. So if you took the picture that I used in the slide, uh, a couple slides ago of Julia Roberts, pop that in there and it's gonna show you every website that that Julia Roberts picture shows up on. And so now the students can see, oh wait, this is a famous actress, um, not some girl in this next state over that's in love with me and wants to run away and marry me. Um, and so it can sometimes be a hard thing for students to learn, but it's an important thing. Um, and even when I tell some adults about this, they have no idea that this can be done. And actually, as I was like searching up information for this for the presentation, one of the things that came up was from like match.com. So this is something that parents and adults and anybody can fall into the trap of. So uh, this is just a great tool no matter what age you are, uh, just to make sure you're being safe on the internet. And again, I tell the students, look back in 1997 when I was on dial up AOL, uh, you know, it was commonplace for people to not be able to put pictures on the internet. If you didn't have a digital camera or a scanner, uh, you probably didn't have a picture of yourself. Uh, but it's 2019, so if somebody has a profile that doesn't have a picture, or they say, oh, I can't get a picture, they're lying. Uh, because 99% of people have access to some kind of digital camera, uh, whether it's on a phone or some sort of device. So no picture is a huge red flag. And another way for them to be safe is when they're getting messages online, uh, and if it's somebody that they're not familiar with, uh, to check to see if this person is friends with anybody that I'm friends with. Now, that doesn't necessarily 100% mean if they are that it is who they say they are, because your friends could fall into this trap that a lot of people fall into. Uh, but it's a great way to have a conversation. How do you know this person? Do you know them in real life? Uh, so, like, actually talk to your friends about this person, and do they actually know them? And again, one of the really crazy things, and I've seen this on that MTV show, Catfish, because uh, adults fall into this, where they send people money. Uh, so I try to tell young people, look, if somebody's online asking you for money, even if they have a profile with your friend's picture on it, um, don't do it. Like, don't even have that conversation. If your friend needs money, you talk to them in real life. Um, you don't do it on the internet, and you never discuss finances with anybody. And this next slide kind of goes back to part one of this series, when I talked about email phishing scams, uh, but this also happens to young people on social media, whether it's Instagram or WhatsApp, or even in their emails, um, they'll get those very vague messages like, hey, how are you? Or I uh, haven't seen you in a while, hit me up when you get a chance. And they'll fall for this because they're not really sure if they know the person, they don't wanna blow a social opportunity, um, and so they'll respond. And then, uh, you know, these people who are phishing, well, now they've got something on the hook because they can start, they know they've got somebody who's a little bit gullible and they can kind of work this relationship. So uh, this is an important one for young people to know. And just a couple more um, quick hitters. Uh, when on social media, uh, is there about me filled out? If it's blank, again, red flag. Um, do they have a picture with any people that you know or places you know? Um, just look for anything that seems suspicious or fishy. 
Uh, you know, again, we just want them to be aware that these dangers are out there. Is this going to keep them 100% from falling into these traps? No, but at least they know that this stuff is out there and they know what to look for. And most importantly, uh, I tell the students to trust their gut. Surprisingly, they have good intuition about this, where if it doesn't feel right, it's usually not. But sadly, they don't always follow that. Um, and again, we just want them to be aware that, look, if it doesn't feel right and you're not sure, well, if it's somebody you know, they'll reach out to you again or they'll see you in real life. Uh, but don't take the bait. Don't fall into one of these things that's just going to snowball out of control. And then this last part, I like to throw in um, sort of for fun, but also because students, uh, depending on their age, don't necessarily know about bots because bots are becoming more um, increasingly commonplace on social media. And I have a few examples uh, to show students where you can talk with the bots and interact with the bots. And sometimes the students don't know that they're not talking to a real person. And as the AI gets better and more sophisticated, it's going to be harder to tell the difference between a real person and um, a bot. And again, the biggest takeaway we want students to walk away from this presentation with is if in doubt, ask. They might be a little embarrassed to ask like a parent or teacher or whoever um, if something is real or not, but I try to tell them that it's a hundred times more embarrassing to make a mistake and get into a situation um, when you should have just asked the first time. So again, when in doubt, just ask. And that will bring us to the conclusion of my Master the Internet series. I hope you found this helpful. If you still haven't seen part one yet about being safe on the internet, again, please check it out. There is a link below. Uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comments section. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please take a second to give it a like, share it with colleagues or friends or anybody who might be interested in helping their students master the internet. Uh, for more information and videos, please visit my website, danielspada.com or follow me on Twitter at Dan Spada. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.